Father, thank you so much. I, I, I say that almost without thinking about thank you. But when you stop and consider what we have to be thankful for, it, it, it catches my breath. I was, I was a sinner. I was so far away from you. I was so rebellious. I didn't, I didn't want anything to do with you. And yet, in spite of all of that, my attitude and my posture toward you, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for my sins. And to offer me redemption through you. And I did not deserve it. None of us do. And this morning, we thank you. From the bottom of our hearts for the gift of grace in Jesus Christ that you have given us. I pray if somebody in this room doesn't know what that means, doesn't know what it means to be saved, to, to be born again, Lord, I pray that today they would hear the word of God, they would hear the gospel preached clearly, and they would come to faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that those of you, those of us who do know the Lord, I, I pray, Jesus, this morning that we would stick to you. That we would cleave to you, cling to you. That every thought would be kept captive because of your word. I pray that every attitude and action would be pleasing to you. I pray that you would lead us to lead our families. We're so grateful for you, Lord. I'm grateful for this church that gives me an opportunity to share your word. I'm grateful for every person who serves here. I'm grateful for everybody sitting in here today. I pray that you bless us with the reading of your word this morning. I pray that we would take the, the words that we responded with today and redeem them. You call us to love you with all our hearts, our souls, our strength, and our mind. Give us, Lord, the ability and the desire to love you like we should. And we'll give you the praise and the honor of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to thank um, our, our praise team. I don't, I don't do that enough. I want to thank Barry and and all of our singers and all of our musicians. Why don't we give them this I know they don't do it for the applause. I know they're doing it for the Lord. But it takes a lot of bravery to stand up here. I have to tell you guys, it's, there's always one moment. And I've done this for a long time. But I, there's always one moment when I stand up here in the lights. And people look in and I think, what if I forget everything that I've prepared? Like, well, <laughs> what do we do in that moment? We just trust the Lord, that's going to be a short sermon that day. Um, not today, but, but one of these days. <laughs> but we're, we're so grateful for you guys. We're so grateful for your, for your service. We're grateful for everybody who serves. Last week we had a chance to honor uh, our, our, our volunteers and the people who serve. And we're so very grateful for you. It, it, Kenneth said this, and I'm going to reiterate it. We could not do this. It, if it was the, the Mark and Kenneth show, uh, the, this would not be a place where you would want to be. It'd be poorly run, but because of the church community gathering together and accomplishing together way more than we could ever do on our own. That's what we're grateful for. We're grateful for you. So usually what happens in churches on, on holidays like today, it, it usually follows a pattern like this. On Mother's Day, we talk about how great our mothers are. We gush on them. They're so great. And then the Proverbs 31 woman, and, and they're so close to the heart of the Lord. And then and it takes a little different of a tone with us than usually on Father's Day. We, we decide to challenge the fathers. And we tell them to step up and man up and lead your families. And I had a guy come to me in one of the churches we served. And he said, I don't even want to come to church sometimes on Father's Day. Because you make me feel like I'm a terrible father. And I, I want to tell you this morning, just being honest with you guys, that is definitely not my goal. As we talk about parenting on purpose over these last few weeks, my hope and my prayer is not that you go home saying, well, I'm a terrible parent. I pretty much doomed my kids. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to them now. That's not my goal. I want to encourage you in the Word of God. The, the Word of God makes it clear to us. God's Word, it never tells us that we're going to be perfect. If somebody in this room says, you know what? You say that, but I have achieved this level of parental perfection that... You don't, you don't even know, right? You're lying to yourself, right? We are sinners in need of a Savior. And the sin that, that has infected us from our birth, our conception, right? It, it infects every single part of us. Not, not just our hearts, but, but the way that we parent, the way that, that we raise our kids, the way that we handle our finances, the way that we do our jobs. It, it infects us and affects us. 
And when God called us into redemption and He saved us by His grace, right, He's working on us day by day by day. When will we be perfect, church? So, okay, so Pastor Mark, you tell me that here on this earth, I have no chance of being perfect. What do you think? That's right, we can't. And that, and that, should, be, that should be an encouragement to you. Because we're not working toward perfection. It's not about perfection, it's about direction. It's about where we're moving. We set our hearts on Christ and we say, Lord, work on this area of my heart. And we, you know the areas that we need to work on. Right? I, I don't. I, I'm glad that God doesn't give me a, you know, a, a crystal ball to see into you all's hearts and minds. Or vice versa for you to see into mine. But day by day I say, Lord, cut out for me what doesn't need to be there. And plant in me the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and mercy. That's what I want to talk about. I don't, I don't want to grind anybody down into the dust and tell you how horrible that you guys are. I want to encourage you today. Dads especially. Look at me up, up here. Dads. God values your position as a father, your role as a father, so much that he designed your role to mirror his relationship with us. Let me say this in a different way. Every time that you lead your family, every time that you take on that role as a father and you lead your family, you are showing your family what it means for the Heavenly Father to love, to provide, to protect, to care for. It's, you're a mirror. The way that you parent is going to be, this may be a scary thing, the way that you parent is going to be the way that your kids view their relationship with God the Father. And he says this, in, and the Lord says this in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12. He says, the Lord loves those he disciplines just as a father, the one in whom he delights. So your role as a dad was designed by God to mirror his relationship it's an amazing thing. You're, 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 not, you're, not, you're not a side character in the story of your family. You're not, you're not just a supporting cast. Even though every single sitcom that we read, what does the dad look like in every sitcom? Like a, like a joke, like a bumbling idiot. Right? I, I look at this and I think, is that? That's how society sees us. That we're worthless. That, that, that we, don't, we, don't, we don't contribute anything. Right? I want you to see this this morning, though. That God values your leadership. You are vital. You are essential in leading your kids toward knowing God your Father. Now everybody listens to me, right? Now, if you're a wife or a mother and you're sitting here saying, it's Father's Day, I'm off the hook today. <laughs> oh, honey, you're going to get it today. Right? No, it's not about that. Every one of us, I want everybody to hear me. I, I, want, you, I want you to hear this every single time you come through the, the doors of this church. I want you to hear this. God loves you. At the core of who he is, the book of 1 John says, God is love. What he does in your life is motivated by love. You know what the greatest act of love that he ever did for any of us was? He sent Jesus Christ to redeem us when we did not deserve it. When we did nothing to earn it, he sent Jesus to give us hope, to give us healing, Give us redemption and forgiveness and bring us back to Him. I hope you hear that every single time you come through the doors of this church, that God loves you, He cares for you, He protects you, He provides for you, He guides you, He, he equips you to serve the church, he, he, he gives you the strength to make it through trials in your life. He sends you to reach this world. He, he is what we need. We need nothing else. And as fathers today, I want to encourage you, as parents today, I want to encourage you you mirror that to your kids, that they know without a shadow of a doubt that you love them. You care for them, provide for them, guide them, give them what they need, not what they want, but what they need. Here's what Chloe wanted for breakfast this morning. <coughs> it starts with a C, ends with an Andy. <laughs> and I, I looked at her and I said, you can't have a candy bar for breakfast. And she looked at me like, well, who wrote these rules? Like, I think it's in the Bible somewhere that you can't have candy for breakfast, but it's, we, we, we give our kids what they need, not what they want, because God does the same for us. He gives us what we need, and sometimes we look and say, I would like this. I, obviously, I'd like a Lamborghini. Lord, don't you know that? Yes, he knows that, and he usually says no, because you don't need that. 
Right? It's a loving father looking at. So we're going to look at this morning one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. One of the most famous passages. It's probably among the people in this room, a passage that a lot of you have memorized. Maybe some of you have claimed as your life verse. This is actually my dad's life verse and maybe his mom's life verse. Uh, BibleGateway.com has a list of the top 100 Bible verses that were ever searched for on the internet. I mean, millions and millions and millions of verses, uh, times that verses were searched for. These two verses are number six on that list. Very significant to our faith. I even found a, a group on Facebook for people dedicated, uh, dedicated to people who had tattooed these verses on their body. This is a significant verse. Let's read this together. Stay with me in Proverbs chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. This, this should be very familiar to you if you've spent time in church. If not, I have the great privilege and pleasure uh, of sharing this verse with you, these two verses with you. So we're going to read these two, and then we're going to talk about what they mean, how to apply them, and then I want to radiate outwards and talk about how to take these verses into every area of our life. So look at it with me. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, what's the first word in yours? Trust. Trust. Trust where? Or in who? In the Lord. With what? In all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know Him or acknowledge Him. And He will make your paths now, if you memorized this like I did in Awana when I was a kid, you probably memorized it in the King James Version. And that was more familiar to me. Every time I read it this week, I, I couldn't get it out of my head. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's the way that I memorized it and learned it. And we talk about verses like this. We memorize verses like this. But I want to talk about what they mean and how to apply them. So let me pray one more time, and we will we'll dive into the to the reading and exposition of God's Word. Thank you, Lord, for verses like these that are deeper than we would ever imagine, but easy enough for a child to grasp. I'm so grateful for your Word. It is incredible. It, it, it astounds me every time I read it, the simplicity of it and the depth of, of wealth, the treasure that we have in your Word. Thank you for it, Lord. Bless the reading of your word as we study it this morning. We'll give you the praise for it in your name. All right, church, you can be seated. So look at this verse, trust. Or look at this word, trust. Trust in the Lord. What does it mean to trust someone? Rely on them. That's a good one. Believe in them. Good. Put your faith in Okay, look at the person next to you. Now look at the person on the other side. Do you trust them? <laughs> if it's someone in your family, you better say yes. If you're like, don't trust that guy. I've been married to him for 30 years. I can't trust him, right? We, tr we, we use this word, and, and, and we have a specific understanding of what it means to trust. You rely on their trustworthy person. They're not going to let you down. They're not going to, uh, they're not going to lie to you. Uh, have you ever heard of a trust fall? Right? That means like I can stand on stage and just like fall backwards and I know Reed is going to dive over the seat and catch me. Although if you did, I would crush you down to me. <laughs> no way you would catch me. <laughs> just, just the way that it is. Right? But we have this definition of what it means to trust someone. But I think God's word goes deeper than just the surface level. They're not going to lie to me. Or I can rely on them. I can, I can depend on them. So I'm going to give you a couple of ways, or four ways, that this word is translated in the Bible. And it kind of gives us a big picture of, of what it means to trust in the Lord. So Judges 18.7. You don't need to look these up. I'm just going to go through them really quickly. Judges 18.7 uses this word trust and translates it as dwelling safely and securely. So it talks about a man who is able to go to, go to sleep at night because he's, his house has a locked door and his city has a wall around it fortified. So, so the, the, the idea of trust in that scenario is I am completely at rest because I'm, I'm trusting my lock on my door. I'm trusting in the wall around my city. 
So that's one way that it's translated. In Psalm 22, 9, we see it in a completely different way, this word trust. And it's translated like this, a baby who falls asleep on her mother's chest. A baby who's just, who's just content and falling asleep on her mother's chest. Okay? So that's a completely different way of seeing it. Then we see it in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. He talks about a city in a, in a land that is completely at peace. He says, you are secure in a peaceful country, surrounded by peaceful neighbors. So you can rest and be secure in the fact that I'm not going to be harmed tonight because I'm at peace with my neighbors. My neighbors are at peace with each other in this nation, and my nation is at peace with all other nations around. So then there's one more, and it's in the book of Hosea, chapter 10, verse 13, and it talks about a king sitting in the middle of his army and going to sleep at night because he trusts that the thousands of soldiers around him are going to protect him. Okay, so it's four different ways it's used. What's the common denominator between all four? Rest. That's a good one. So each one of those, people are able to rest with no worry, no anxiety, and no fear because they trust in something stronger than themselves. So the, the lock, the guy's trusting my lock is going to keep me safe. Right? The wall around my city is going to keep me safe. I can rest in that. The, the baby on the mother's chest, right? That, that baby doesn't have a care in the world. Sometimes I look at my, my baby Sophie when I, I put her to sleep last night. She fell asleep in my arms. And Mindy's like, do you want me to lay her down? I'm like, no. It's almost Father's Day. I want, to, I want to hold her. I want to love her. I want to feel her heartbeat because she trusts completely. Falling asleep in somebody's arms. Like that's, a, that's, a, that's a level of trust I don't think we achieve. Look at the person next to you on either side. Would you fall asleep in their arms? If it's another dude, you're like, okay, this is making me uncomfortable. I don't, I don't like where this conversation is going. Right? But this baby looks and says, I've got nothing to worry about because my mom loves me. My dad loves me. The, the man who lives in a peaceful country, he can sleep at night because he knows my, my world, all that I know is that peace. And then the king in the middle of his army says, I have nothing to worry about because I've got thousands of people willing to put their lives on the line to protect me. It's all about trust. We trust it. So it's not the surface level idea of I believe in you or I, I, uh, I, I, I know that you're not going to lie to me. This idea of trusting in the Lord with all your heart is saying, Lord, I give you everything that I have. I can rest at night because I know that you will keep my family safe. I know that you will help me in this situation at my work. I know that you will help me in this situation with my child, my prodigal who won't come home. I know that you will be my, my, my fortress and my protection in this financial situation. I know that I can give everything to you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says casting all our cares on him. Why? Because he cares He's the perfect picture of a father. Jesus said, your heavenly father knows what you have need of before you ask it of him. You think there's ever been a moment where I, you have looked at the Lord and said, Lord, I don't know what to do in this situation. And he says, you know what, I don't either. You think there's ever been that moment? No, he says, listen, trust me. Fall back on me. Just fall asleep in my arms because I've got this. So that's this idea of trust. When you're trusting in Him, like it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, you do not rely on your own understanding. If I'm relying on my own understanding, who am I not trusting? The Lord, Dr. Seuss, right? You've got it all backwards and, and Yoda-like. But when you look at it like this, if I'm relying on me, on my strength, on my wisdom, on my potential, on my job, on my 401k, if I'm relying on all this stuff, I'm not relying on the Lord. So give it to me. Give it to him. I know you're struggling with an issue this morning. All of us are. There's something that's weighing your heart now. There's something that causes you to, to lay in your bed at night and panic. I know there is a pain to him. Give it to him today. Cast it all on the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. So if you take that definition and look at it in terms of the rest of this passage, how, how does this play out in each part of our life? That's what I want to look at this morning. So number one, look at me with this. Uh, trust Him with your family. Trust Him with your family. All right, dads, what would you do for your kids? How far would you go to protect them? Now, I'm not going to indict you. 
you say, I'll murder anyone at any time. <laughs> They're blind to protect my kids. What would you do? Anything? Almost anything? Mostly anything? What if somebody threatened your kids? You keep them safe? We know we would. It's, it's funny, the first time I ever held a baby in my entire life was my baby Chloe on January 15th, 2013. And I looked at her and I said, okay, nobody will ever hurt me. Because I will. I'll do everything I can. Right? We have this fierce love of love and protection. We think that we can keep them safe, but ultimately, ultimately the heart of, of a person who trusts in the Lord says, I can't do everything. But Lord, you can, and I trust. Amen. Look at this in, in verse 1. Let's go to verse 1 of chapter 3. My son. Who's he talking to? It's not a trick question. His son. My son. Don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands, for they will bring you many days a full life and well-being. Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and high regard with God. So this is the fifth time that Solomon has addressed his son, has specifically said, my son. We tend to look at the book of Proverbs, for lack of a better term, like a book of collective fortune cookie papers. You know, it's just like, oh, I like that one, and I like that one, and, and I'll take that one, and that one's great, and I'll have this one. But the truth is that this is not just a collected group of things that popped into Solomon's head. It's not like, you know what, today I want to talk about that. No, it's, this, is, this is him writing specifically to his son. This is real for him. He's looking at this saying, my son, I, I love you, and all I want for you is to follow this path that I've laid out for you. Because it's going to lead you to the Lord. It's going to lead you to life and wisdom in the Lord. So he says this over and over and over. My son, and where does it start, church? Are you going to be able to tell your kids it starts with your behavior? You just got to behave right and God will accept you? No. Look where it says. It says, my son, don't forget my teachings, but let what keep my commands. What is your saying, verse 1? Let your heart keep my commands. It starts here. Then he goes in verse 3. Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of what? Your iPad. Oh, your heart. It's, it starts here. Your kids need to hear it and they need to see it. That, that God's word sinks deep into our hearts. How can a young man stay pure? Psalm 119.9 says. By taking heed according to your word. Right? It, this is how it starts. How God's word dug down deep into our hearts. Look what, look what happens when you trust the Lord with your family. You say, I, I do trust the Lord with my family, but I also trust my gun again for my family. Right? Now, listen to what happens with a person who trusts in the Lord for their family. Psalm 37 says, a person's steps are established by the Lord. Remember Proverbs 3, 6. It says, he will make your path straight. And then it says, he takes pleasure in his way, and though he falls... He will not be overwhelmed because the Lord supports him. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous abandoned or his children begging for bread. The Lord is always generous, always lending, and his children are blessed. That's, that's the life and the family of a person who says, Lord, it's all yours. It's all yours. It's not mine. I open my hands and I give it to you. And there are so many times, church, that I look at my family, I look at my kids, and I say, Lord, I don't know how to do this. Maybe I'm alone, maybe you're like, that's me every day. Okay, I don't, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to keep them safe in a world that is getting darker and darker. How, what do I do? How do I protect Chloe? She loves YouTube now. She's a YouTube addict, and she watches all these videos right now. They're very safe. It's kids playing with toys. Who would have thought that that would be the next million dollar idea is playing with toys in front of a video camera. But she watches those. But how do I keep her, Lord, how do I keep her safe from the other things that she's not supposed to see? How do I keep her safe from what Satan wants in her life? How do I do that? And church, I know we ask these questions all the time, and this is how you do it. You give it to the Lord. You give it to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't. I don't have all the answers. I'm not perfect. I'm broken. But you know exactly. You love my daughter more than I do. You literally 
laying down your life for her defense and for her redemption. Give your family to the Lord. You, you, can, you can protect them all day long and help you do. You can provide for them all day long and hope you do. You can love them and you can lead them. You can do all the things that you're supposed to do. But if you miss this, if you miss leading them toward the Lord and leading them toward a relationship in Jesus, then listen, we fail. Lead them and give them to the Lord. Number two, so trust Him with your family. Number two, trust Him with your own life. Trust Him with your life. Look what it says in verse 7. Skip down to verse 7 there. Don't be wise in your own eyes. I think my dad said that to me several times before. A little wise acre. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away. This will be healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. Healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. Where do they come from? Doctors and personal trainers? Is that how I get healthy and stronger? Sort of. My body will. But listen, every day, every breath, every second that I'm alive on this earth, it's not because of doctors or obviously not personal trainers. You can look at me and say, that guy's probably never seen a personal trainer in his life, right? But as we look at this, right, it's not, it's not me keeping myself alive. My strength is not in myself. It's in the Lord. Listen to what Job said. Listen to what Job said. The Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. He recognized every breath we take is a gift from God Almighty. We don't trust in our own strength. We don't trust in our own wisdom. We don't trust in our own paths. We give it to the Lord. So trust Him with your family. Trust Him with your life. Number three. Follow me here, okay? Don't lose me here. Trust him with your finances. You're like, Pastor Mark, on Father's Day, you're bringing up money on Father's Day. Yes, I am, because the Lord brings it up here in his word. Look at verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. The heart of a person who says, Lord, it's all yours. My heart, my life, my family, my job, everything that I have, it's yours. The heart like that trusts the Lord and honors the Lord with his money. And I know there's a, there's, this is a sticky topic in church. And, and the, the number one reason, one of the number one reasons, probably number two or number three, of why people refuse to come to church is because they say, the church is only after my money. Right? And so they use that as an excuse not to come to church. Listen, I'm not after money. <laughs> I'm not, that's, 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 a, that's a topic between you and the Lord. I don't know how much you give, and I don't want to know. Right? If you come up to me and say, well, I give this, I'm not going to listen to it. I don't want to know. Right? That's between you and the Lord. And a person who trusts in the Lord with all their heart honors the Lord first. With what, Lord, if I'm trusting you and I'm relying on you, I'm, I'm fully leaning on you, I'm giving you everything. It's all yours anyway. We, Jesus said you can't serve both God and God. We, we know that. So we serve God with our money. We use what God has given us, the, the financial resources God has given us, and we honor Him with that. Now let me say this. Okay? It's 11 o'clock, so I'm going to keep going here. If you look at this, verse 2 of chapter 3 says, it talks about God blessing us with many days a full life and well-being. And then in verse 8, it talks about healing for your body, strengthening for your bones, and then here in verse 10, your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. This sounds like health and wealth, doesn't it? So it is Pastor Mark saying that if you trust in the Lord, God will bless you with health and wealth and prosperity? Listen. No, okay. Listen, and this, and this is this is a very popular opinion now. It's a very popular teaching in churches. As long as I do what I'm supposed to do, God is going to bless me with the things that I want. That's not the goal. If that's your goal, then you're going to get what you want, and that's it. Right? The, the Lord says that's, that's not, you can't serve both God and money. It's not about those things. If you make health and wealth and the things of this world your priority and your end result, you're going to be very disappointed in Right, so, so we look at this, the, the goal, the reward, and the treasure is God himself. Trust in what with all your heart? The Lord. Trust in your paycheck with all your heart? Trust in your good doctor's report 
your low cholesterol, trust in, trust in that the 401k that you set aside, trust in uh, your IRA, your mutual funds, trust in those. No, trust in the Lord. He is the end result. You've got to remember as we read through Proverbs that these are Proverbs, not promises. All right, Proverbs, not promises. This is in a genre that we call poetry. All right, so when we read these, he is not saying this happens, so this must happen. He's saying if you follow the Lord in your life, if you give your heart to Christ and you walk with him, you will be blessed. How God blesses you works out in a lot of different ways. But how I know this in life is that this is that people who love the Lord very dearly die young. You've seen this, right? So that means they weren't blessed with long life. How about this? People who love the Lord very much and serve Him with everything live in poverty their whole lives. I think of almost every person I grew up with in religion. They would look at that teaching and say, well, what about me? I'm serving the Lord. I'm doing all of this. Why am I not being blessed with health and wealth? Because the blessings, first and foremost, are spiritual. Are spiritual blessings. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about we have been blessed with the highest spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. When we have those things, we don't need it the things in this world. Because your, your wealth, your, your retirement accounts, even the strongest, fattest retirement accounts, what happens when the market crashes? You lose it. So what happens to the people whose trust and confidence was in their finances? It's gone. It crumbles. What about this? The, the person who says, I've got a good, clean bill of health. I'm a strong, healthy young man. Okay? What happens when, when people age? I'll say this nicely. Right? It starts to hurt. Things start to not work the way that they were originally working. Uh, we deteriorate. We do the same thing. And so how about the person who is trusted in his own strength? What happens to him? He's going to be very disappointed. Jesus said this, if you hear my words and put them into practice, you're like a man who built his house on a solid foundation, on a rock. We say about that this morning. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. What happens when you put all your trust in the Lord this morning? Will he crumble? Will he fade? Will he vanish? Will he become irrelevant? No. He'll stand strong in the midst of it. This is how you build your family. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build the labor in vain, it says in the book of Psalms. So trust him with your family, with your life, with your finances. Last thing, I'll wrap up with this. Trust Him through discipline. Trust Him through discipline. And you say, Pastor Mark, it was good until this point. I don't want to talk about discipline. I don't want to talk about bad things happening in my life. But look what it says in verses 11 and 12. Do not despise what? The Lord's instruction, the Lord's discipline. Do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines whom? The ones he's real mad at? The ones he just wants to straighten up? No, it says the Lord disciplines the ones he loves just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. We've got this wrong view of discipline that if something bad is happening in my life, whether it's a, a financial problem, a work problem, a family problem, or, or a job problem, whatever it is, we have a tendency to look and say, God, why are you doing this? Well, what if, you're, you're hurting me. We, we tend to view it as punishment. But listen, this says really clearly that God disciplines the one he loves. Every trial that, you're, that comes into your life, no matter how hard it is, or how trying it is, or how difficult it is, is God's love working hope and healing into your life. If you trust Him in everything, if you say, Lord, it's yours, I trust you. But then you fall to pieces when the first trial comes into your life. What does that say about your trust? It's not with all your heart. Look and say, Lord, I know you brought this into my life. It's for a purpose. You're leading me to depend on you. You're leading me to trust in you even more, and I trust you through it. I'm going to, I will just walk with you through this process. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that it's going to, it's going to fix all your problems, but it's not about fixing things. It's about trust. About trusting the Lord who's seen the beginning and the end. He knows exactly what you need. So stop asking, 
how can I get out of this? And start asking, what can I get out of this? So we've reached the end of our series called Parenting on Purpose. Remember my goal in the series was not to tell you how bad of parents you are. I feel like that's what every article that you read tells us. Like, these are all the ways that we have failed as parents. These are all the ways that you have permanently scarred your children and they're going to have to have therapy for the rest of their lives, right? That's what the world tries to tell you. But the truth is this. I want to encourage you. I, and I hope you're not looking at my words and saying, if I do what Pastor Mark says, then my kids will turn out great. It's not about that. Remember the goal of my series? We go to the wisest man who has ever lived, who is Jesus Christ, so that he can equip us with the greatest parenting tool that is available to us today, which is God's Word. My, my hope and my prayer is that you go to Jesus on behalf of your family, for the sake of your family. You go to Jesus and you go to His Word every single day, open it, and say, Lord, my family needs this today. I need to trust in you with all 